Bridget Stutchbury is strictly for the birds, and particularly the songbirds. She's a scientist who studies songbird migration, behavior, and social life. She analyzes what their songs mean and how these tiny creatures make their way from as far south as Uruguay to as far north as the boreal forests of Canada, losing up to half of their body weight in the process. She studies their habitat, their sex lives, their flight paths, and the contributions they make to the very fabric of North American life. Our forests, our crops, our gardens, all depend on the birds. Dr. Stutchbury sounds a warning about the threats to their survival. Habitat destruction, pesticides, predators, and collisions with skyscrapers, for starters. At least 18 species are in sharp decline. But Bridget Stutchbury also shows how each of us can make a difference to the lives of these heartbreakingly wonderful little birds by acts as simple as choosing bird-friendly coffee and toilet paper and turning off the lights in our offices. Above all, Bridget Stutchbury reawakens our sense of wonder at the birds who surround us and who bring such joy and color to our lives. I wanted to start, at one point you used the phrase storms of angels to describe bird migration and, and to describe the size of it. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, that term comes from uh, radar operators who noticed in the 1940s these big clouds on their radar and they didn't know what was making those images on their radar, so they called them angels. And it was only later that they discovered that these are actually flocks of migrating birds. And radar bounces off water droplets, and bird bodies, like our bodies, are made mostly of water, so the radar will bounce off birds as well. And we can see the, the huge scale of bird migration by using ordinary weather radar. Most of the birds that I study fly at night, so it's dark out and they're too high, they would be too high to see anyhow, because they, they have, you know, it'd be two, 500 feet up in the sky, you wouldn't be able to see a small warbler. But on weather radar, you can see these massive clouds of birds that alight after sunset and take to the skies on their migration. And in one radar image, the, the whole screen could be covered in bright red, you know, knowing that the red radar are usually the really nasty storms that we try to, try to avoid. Uh, the whole screen is lit up in bright red because there are just so many birds in the sky. It's as though there's a giant storm of birds flying over. But meanwhile, most people in their homes are unaware of this spectacle that's happening overhead. It's like whole nations kind of going across right over the city and nobody looks up and or if they do look up, they can't see them anyway. Well, even if it was in the daytime, you wouldn't really be able to see them. It's, it's not as though they're the size of a Canada goose and flying over your house. Uh, it's, it's really hard to grasp the full scale of migration and the numbers of birds involved when you're on the ground with a pair of binoculars. I mean, you see the birds in the trees, you know it's migration season because you might see a black pole warbler passing through but uh, it's really through the radar images that we've been able to piece together the full scale of migration, because it's not just in one location. You can actually look at the radar throughout the United States and try to capture those images on a single night. And you can see that not only is the Buffalo, ra you know, New York radar lit up, but so is Houston and New York City and everywhere up and down the coast. It's a continental scale movement, which is really amazing. Fabulous. Yeah, I had no idea. You've got a, somewhere in, in uh, one of the books, you've got a sort of a time-lapse chart that shows the eastern end of Lake Ontario and the whole end of the lake, like, you know, a third of, the, of Lake Ontario is completely covered with this cloud of birds. Yeah, and so and in, when we get uh, events where you have, say in the spring, a series of cold fronts that kind of stop the birds from moving north, mm -hmm. and then suddenly the weather turns and you get a warm front, of course the birds are going to ride those southerly winds to help them in their journey. Mm -hmm. And it's on those nights that you get the most spectacular migration movements uh, on the kind of scale that I was talking. It's not just one half of Lake Ontario and it's not just one city. It's all up and down the eastern seaboard, just a huge massive wave that goes en masse. And you've talked also about when these clouds land and, and they just kind of like sink into the, into the world. You don't see them. They, they just, they, they land and they're in the reeds and, and you know, grasses and forests and so forth and they're quite invisible until yeah. they... 
The, the birds start landing in the middle of the night, so when they run out of energy, they have to stop flying, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so for some individuals that perhaps are in poor shape or didn't put on as much fat the night before, they'll be coming down out of the sky two, three, four o'clock in the morning. So in darkness, they have to find a safe place to land. And especially if there's bad weather in the middle of the night, they'll all come down at once. And what's remarkable is that pretty much anywhere you live, any park, any backyard, has the chance, a good chance, of having one of these migratory songbirds stop to rest because they're passing through in such huge numbers and it's such happenstance where a particular bird is going to have to sort of make an emergency pit stop uh, that the miracle of it all is that all of us have a chance to witness that kind of bird migration even in the smallest of backyards you could have a white-throated sparrow or, or a yeah. yellow rump warbler or something that you, you may never have seen it before but it's in plain view right there in your yard you talk about energy with them and, and, and running out of energy, and, and one of the things that struck me as I, as I read through your work was, was, you don't exactly say this, but I have the sense that you, that you think of the birds in part as being like um, uh, little vorti vortices of energy, that they, you know, they, they, and they use energy in, in specific kinds of ways and so forth. I was struck by this, particularly when you talked about the migrations across the Gulf of Mexico. And how much energy, how, how do they burn, how much energy do they, do they burn during that? Well, the, a lot of the, the songbirds, um, well, and, and other birds too, the, will fly across the Gulf of Mexico. So a, 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 on their way north, for instance, they'll leave the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula and make landfall somewhere near New Orleans. And it's estimated that this flight is, takes 18, 20 hours nonstop. We're dealing with birds that weigh 10 or 12 grams. So pr pretty tiny little mm -hmm. birds, and they have to fly nonstop for that long. And sure, they have a tailwind, so it's not all powered flight. They have a little bit of help from the wind. Uh, but they have to put on several grams, or they have to gain weight, maybe 20, 20 to 25 percent extra weight to pork up. <laughs> and that's the fuel they burn as they're flying. And so people have done studies in flight tunnels to sort of convert this into kilojoules per unit time. I don't know what the numbers are. I Miles can't remember. Per <laughs> yeah, that sort of thing. I can't yeah. remember. Um, but certainly in terms of, of them being, their whole physiology changes during migration. So if we think of mammals, for instance, uh, things like polar bears will prepare for, for hibernation and they'll start overeating in the fall. Their whole body and physiology changes to allow them to overeat, to allow them to make fat, to allow them to sleep through the winter. I mean, their, their whole body changes, right, on the inside. And the same thing happens with these migratory birds, that during migration, inside their bodies, their whole physiology changes to allow, you know, this incredible weight gain. They burn it off in, in one night flight, weight gain, burn it off the next night. And once they get to the breeding grounds, all of that kind of stops, and they go back to eating normally and kind of being on a diet again. Wow. But they'll burn up a very high percentage of their own body weight in a single night. Right, it's, it's the, like mostly that. it's the fat that they're burning, but it is true, even say with humans, that if they overdo it, or if they run into an emergency situation and they need to make energy, they will burn muscle mass, which isn't very healthy mm -hmm. to start burning up your muscle mass in order to keep going. Uh, so on the most part, the sort of optimal migration is built around burning this fat, which is stored temporarily. Yeah. That's their gas tank. <laughs> yeah. And then and a large portion of their muscle mass is in the breast muscles and just the muscles that make the wings go. Right, right yes. I mean, for birds, the, the, their biggest muscles are the flight muscles on their breast. Yeah. 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 You also talk about their physiology in terms of how fast they breathe and how fast their hearts beat and so forth. Can we talk a little about that, too, because that was fascinating. Well, birds have a much higher metabolism than we do. Um, part of that is so that they can power their flight. Um, part of it is because they're small. So generally, small-bodied animals have a higher heart rate and metabolic rate than the larger animals. The birds in particular uh, have a very fast heart rate and oxygen consumption. In fact, their lungs are built completely differently than ours because part of burning energy is using up oxygen. So you can't, it's not just a matter of burning the energy, it's a matter of getting the oxygen to fuel those flight muscles. And so their lungs are kind of designed more like a straw than a balloon. 
So our lungs are kind of like a balloon, right? They fill up, and then when you exhale, the balloon collapses. Well, they have a one-way airflow through their lungs because that's much more efficient. There's sure, no dead sure. air left behind. It just goes through one way, and they extract maximum oxygen out of the air and put it into the blood. And again, this is getting to your question. Part of how their physiology, even down to how the lungs are designed, is all about energy and fueling the flight muscles because you can't fly without using a lot of energy and you can't use a lot of energy without having your whole oxygen respiration system kind of ramped up a notch as well. Mm. I think you said at one point that, I don't know how common this is, but one of the birds at least had the heartbeat is 500 times a minute and, and, that's, the, that's and the breath typical. is 200 times? The smaller birds, yeah, when in flight. Mm. And in fact, when you hold them in your hand, you can feel that rapid heart rate. And yeah. so if I'm doing bird banding demonstrations um, to people who have, haven't held a bird before, they think the bird's um, ill or something because they can feel its heart beating so incredibly quickly or they think it's terribly frightened, which That's it probably right. is a little frightened, but their heart rate naturally is incredibly high. Incredibly high. Yeah. That sounds like one of my favorite birds, the bobolink. Oh, okay, yes. The bobolink is a grassland bird, and uh, sometimes it's called the skunk bird because it's black with a white stripe on its back. Um, and they have that crazy song that males give. The males will kind of flutter over the hay fields or grasslands, kind of doing a funny, wobbly flight, uh, showing off to the females and give this song at the same time. And uh, males will often attract more than one female to nest on their territory. So if they're really good at their flight displays and courtship songs, they can often get more than one female at a time. Now this takes a lot of energy, right? This, uh, the, both the, the eccentric flight and other displays like that, and also the song. They, for male birds, uh, the, the displays that they do to females, almost by definition, take a lot of energy. Because from the female's point of view, they're trying to judge which male is in the best condition, which is going to have the best territory. In fact, in some cases, which male even has the best DNA, the good genes, so to speak, that her offspring are going to inherit. So females use traits that are hard for males to display. Otherwise, there's no way a female could tell a good male from a bad male. And so females do look at the colors. They look at the, these courtship displays, which by definition or they were difficult to do or costly energetically. Mm -hmm. And certainly the song is part of that. Making sound uh, costs energy too. And, and, uh, and there are real differences in the quality between, uh, say, a really primo male and a, and a secondary level of male. The different sound to the songs, different look to the bird itself. Well, people have done a number of experiments uh, not, not with bobolinks and other species where um, to really get at whether these displays and songs reflect true male quality, um, you can stand back and watch and try to pretend you're a female bird, perhaps. <laughs> that, that doesn't work so well. <clears throat> um, but we can do experiments. So people have done experiments where they deliberately infect a male bird with a common bird parasite, sort of malarial type parasite, which they routinely get. So it's, it's fair game, I guess. And then they compare the displays of the males who are in good health and the males who you know are in poor health to test whether the display reveals health, and indeed it does. You know, the males that are in poor health either can't sing as much or they can't jump as high or can't do as many flights per hour. And so these are the, some of the ways that the scientists can do experiments to really show uh, that the male displays are showing the female something important when it comes to mate yeah. choice. Yeah, she makes her choice based on, on what looks like, you know, somebody strong and healthy and right. helpful around the house and <laughs> good with the kids. Well, interestingly, in it works differently in different kinds of birds. So in some birds, the female really only cares about the song. With other ones, the females might only care about the display. And in yet other ones, the main cue seems to be the appearance of male. Uh, what are his colors? And especially uh, the red colors that we see in birds like cardinals, for instance, or house finches. Males can't make red colors. Birds can't make the red color out of their own bodies. They have to get it from their food. So these carotenoids come through the diet 
And then inside the bird's bodies, the carotenoids can be stored in the beak, you know, for birds that have red skin or red beaks, or stored in the feathers when they grow their feathers. But males face a choice, because carotenoids are important for fighting diseases, too. They play a role in the immune system. So here the females are choosing bright red males. Why? Because the male has to choose. I don't mean mentally choose, but faces a trade-off. Either you keep their, your carotenoids in the bloodstream where they can fight diseases, or you put them into your feathers to show off to the females. And the only males who can afford to be bright red are the ones that are in good health. Okay. Right? And so there's an example where it seems a little bit roundabout. I mean, the displays and singing, it kind of seems yeah. obvious. But even with the colors of birds, people have done these kinds of experiments and shown that even the color reflects the male's health when he was growing his feathers. And you have kind of wellness to spare if your yeah, colors are bright right, like that. Right. Yeah. And so it's a true yeah. test. Yeah. yeah. And birds see different colors, or see color differently than we do too, you're saying. Yeah, and I find that frustrating. I'm I do too. <laughs> <laughs> Someone who's yeah. studied birds for 20 odd years now, uh, I find it really frustrating to think that, as a, especially as a scientist, that, they're, that I don't see a bird the same way as they see each other. Birds can see in the ultraviolet, whereas we can't. So the, the ultraviolet is sort of like bees. Bees can mm -hmm. see in the ultraviolet, and we know that some flowers to us just look yellow. But actually, in the center, they reflect brilliantly in the UV as, as kind of a target for the bee to come and find the flower. So we've known that for a long time. Well, birds can see UV as well. So it means when I take a picture of a bird or see one in the field and go, oh, this male is brighter red than that male, actually, that's not a very objective way to judge the male's appearance because they can see ultraviolet. And even patches of color, which might be ordinary and white to us. Like my favorite example is the white crowned sparrow, which is one that has brilliant white stripes on the head. To us, it just looks white, sort of ordinary. But it reflects in the UV. So it's just a glow with color oh, to really? each other. So we might look at a bird and go, oh, he's a dull sparrow. But they're not. They're just as bright as a cardinal to each other, except that we can't see it. So the only way we can measure it is with machines. So you get a spectrophotometer, which measures the light reflectance and gives you a graph showing a big peak in the ultraviolet. But I still can't see it. Isn't that all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know it seems, it's there, but I can't see it. Yes, well, it's, but it's, it's a worthwhile reminder of our own deficiencies, mm -hmm. isn't it? I mean, the things that we cannot do that right. other animals Even with can. bird song, I can't hear what birds hear which is really? doubly frustrating. Yeah. We can hear the same frequency range. So if you play a really high frequency sound, I can hear it just as well as the bird, low frequency, I can hear it. But what birds can do that we can't do is to detect two uh, sounds that are very close together in time. So what to us might sound like a single pulse, dun, to the bird, they might be 10 different sounds strung together, in all in one? different frequencies. To us, we hear a single bloop, and to the birds, whoa. It's like, ah. And so when, again, you can, at least there, you can slow down the tape so that you can get a feel. If you slow it down, and like an old reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, if you slow it down, then it sounds almost like a whale's song, you know, the rising and fall. There's all this detail in the sound that our ears cannot pick up. But it the just birds goes so can. fast. It's just, to, to us, it's going by too fast. It's like watching a movie on Fast Forward. Right? You miss all the detail, you the but if you play it on regular speed, now you can see all the action. So that's what's happening with the bird's ears, that, uh, that they hear so much more detail and use it you know, for communicating with each other. Mm, absolutely fine. Let's hear another one. That is, that is the, the king of the birds, Tyrannus Tyrannus, which makes you think of T-Rex. Yes, hope. absolutely. But it's actually the king bird. Oh, yeah. Its Latin name is Tyrannus Tyrannus, and it's named because of its incredibly feisty, aggressive behavior. Uh, if you see a hawk fly by anywhere near an eastern kingbird territory, 
that kingbird will fly up and just dive bomb the hawk and chase it out of there. They're very aggressive in defending their territories and will take on a bird 10 times their size just to drive it away. And so, yeah, the eastern kingbird. And a very small bird too, right? A uh, uh, little smaller than a robin. Okay, oh, yeah. so not that small. Not I tiny, but yeah, on the yeah. small side. But yeah, yeah, yeah. How does a bird make an egg? You, you, you make That's a reference a good, to the, to well, but I, I never it's, thought it's about it. It's funny because we, have, we most, most of us eat chicken eggs, but we haven't thought twice about how it actually happens. Mm. Um, well, females have an oviduct and the egg starts off, we can think of the yolk on the inside, the yellow part. That's the beginnings of it and that is fertilized by a sperm and then it travels down this long tube. And as it travels down the long tube, the different layers are put on. So uh, you know, again, have to put on the egg white, and then you have to put on the various layers of shell. And as the egg travels down, it is built from you know top to bottom, and then finally it comes out the other end. Um, in part, it's the fertilization process, which is you know perhaps surprising because the egg can only be fertilized between when it's released from the female's. Um, uh, body into the oviduct. So there's there's actually a, a tube. It looks like a funnel, and the female releases her, her the that yolk, and it's not fertilized yet, and it passes in and it gets grabbed by this funnel, which has the funny name infundibulum. If you wanted to know, <laughs> <laughs> the only time the sperm can do its job is during the 30 minutes between when that little yolk is released, the ova, and when it gets sort of vacuumed up into the oviduct. So from a male's point of view, the job of fertilizing the egg, there's a 30 minute window when a sperm can actually fertilize the egg. So that's when copulation has to occur? No, or, or, uh, or just not the, or necessarily, the because the copulation happens at the other end of the tube. Mm -hmm. And so there has to be time for the sperm to swim up the tube and get to the top. Okay. Because the sperm comes in the bottom, and yet the fertilization happens at the top. Uh, some female birds can store sperm, okay. but again, the sperm storage happens at the bottom, not at the top. So either way, there's this long swimming race to get to the top. Uh, and female birds can indeed make eggs that are unfertilized. The egg looks the same to us, whether it's fertilized or not. Huh? Um, chickens, or the chicken eggs that we eat get from the grocery store unfertilized. Yeah. That, I mean, that doesn't stop her from making the egg. It's just sort of a waste of her time and energy yeah, <laughs> from that's a right. reproductive she's, point of view. But she's never if the rooster. sperm's not there, the <laughs> yeah. egg just keeps going, you know, and it gets laid and it never hatches. Uh, so it's a, it's a, the timing is kind of precise, mm -hmm. and they only can make one egg at a time. Uh, so it's not, it's not like mammals that can, you know, lay a litter mm -hmm. of eight kittens all at once. It's like, no, one egg a day, sometimes mm -hmm. every other day. We'll lay an egg, and then two days later, the next egg comes, and two days later, the next egg comes. So it's actually a long, involved process to, to get the actually, work Actually, a day doesn't sound like a terribly long time for something as complex and sophisticated as that. You know? Well, that maybe not, yeah. Seems, seems pretty brisk. I mean, given that that's, that's really a, an astonishing structure. And it takes, a, we were talking before about birds being energy limited. Mm -hmm. For making eggs, it takes more than just energy. It takes a lot of calcium, a lot of protein, and other nutrients. Uh, the female really needs a lot of resources in her body in order to make four eggs in a row. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of her preparing for that, uh, and at the same time choosing mates, and who's gonna, you know, who's she gonna pair with, and judging male quality, the male have their own contests for displaying and singing and showing off, but on the female's part, she's working hard too, <laughs> just <laughs> making those eggs. Yeah. What we're talking about here is, is largely new knowledge, right? There's an awful lot we now we've learned, say, within your lifetime about Certainly. birds. Certainly. Eh? Uh, something like the UV vision mm -hmm. in birds is something that has come along in the past couple decades. Uh, certainly when it comes to the social behavior of birds, um, there's a lot you can't see with binoculars. After all, we're stuck on the ground trying to figure out what birds are doing, and they're highly mobile and often disappear out of sight whether they're in a forest in just around the corner or whether they're colonial birds that are off feeding miles away from the colony. There's a lot we can't see. Uh, and it's in part the new technologies that have come along that have allowed us into the bird's world. 
whether it's measuring UV reflectance with a spectral photometer, DNA testing to find out just who was the father, who is the father of those eggs, mm -hmm. uh, tracking devices. There's been all kinds of innovations and in tracking devices so we can actually put a tracking device on the bird and then follow, follow it or find out after the fact where it's been satellite tags are available for the larger birds. You can actually use kind of GPS tags to know from any day to another where that bird is. They've done this with peregrine falcons, for instance, flying all the way down to South America. And even the radar we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are doing radar studies. They're concerned about wind turbines and how do wind turbines impact bird migration? Are we gonna, is it gonna be a slaughter you know, with birds flying into the, the blades or not? Well, how do you study bird migration around these big wind turbines? Well, without radar, I, I'm not sure there would be any practical way to do it. But with radar, you can see where the birds are. You can measure how many are flying over in one place versus another. You can get some idea of which areas have the highest concentrations of migrants that are up in the sky. Uh, until then, I think we studied migration mostly by looking at birds when they were on the ground stopped. But that's not really what we want to do. We want to study them while they're in flight and moving. And so it's these new technologies mm -hmm. that allow this. It's new attitudes too, though, isn't it? I mean, the, 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 uh, when one thinks of science, when I think the layman tends to think, oh, well, labs and white coats and test tubes and so forth. But you're a scientist and you're actually out there in the bush, right? Yeah. And I think um, even for the kind of work I do, studying birds, people envision someone in hiking boots and binoculars and bird watching. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I'm not a bird watcher, I'm a bird detective and there's a big difference. But I think for a lot of people they don't know the difference between watching birds and ident you know, being a member of the Audubon Society or some nature club uh, versus actually studying it scientifically. And uh, as I said, uh, there's a lot of science that can be done with a pair of binoculars and a notebook. Uh, a lot of brilliant work is still being done that way and has been done in the past. Just observing birds and knowing what they're doing and measuring it is really important, but certainly uh, are the new tools that we have now, uh, taking blood samples and looking at directly at the health of the bird in terms of their stress hormone levels and whether they're putting on fat or losing fat and using feather isotopes, to, for instance, is another way. But when, when feathers grow in, um, the hydrogen isotopes in the rain are kind of locked into those feathers. So if you go down thousands of kilometers away to the wintering grounds and catch a bird and sample its feather, that feather grew on the breeding grounds. So you can sample the feather, measure the hydrogen isotopes and figure out whether it came from you know, Canada or Pennsylvania or Florida just by the information that's locked into the feathers. And it's this kind of work that I think makes people realize that, that the kind of science that I do and others do on birds is not just bird watching. No, it's, it's mm -hmm. not. But, it, but on the other hand, it can't be done without being out there where the birds are. Right? You've got to right, be talking right, to the yeah, birds yeah. and being where the birds are, being there where they, where they came from and where they go to. And, and, uh, you know. and it's the field work of sort of living and breathing yeah. birds and getting to know, at least my work focuses on individual species. So you have to get to know them extremely well. You have to know how to catch them, how to find them on the breeding grounds. Finding their nests is critical. Um, and for some birds, like wood thrush that we study, it could take four or five hours per female to actually track down her nest, unless she has a radio tag on. <laughs> if she has a radio tag on and she's sitting on her nest, we can find it easily. And that's what we've resorted to doing, because without that kind of help, it takes just way too long to sneak around and try to catch her flying or carrying a little piece of nesting material. She's pretty careful not to give away where her nest is. And so it's sort of a, a hide and seek kind of game. But if we cheat and put on a radio tag, uh, then we can just march right up and find her nest you know, in half an hour. And you've also found that, that a lot of those birds are very, very social, that they, you know, they, they, they really don't want to I mean, some have a territory and there's a pair there, or maybe a pair and mm -hmm. some helpers or something, but then there are other ones that, that really want to, want to be together, right? Right, I think most of, the, most of the time we look at birds and their, their needs in terms of habitat. So what kind of forest do they need? What kind of marsh do they need? Um, but they also need normal social lives. 
And, and by that, even birds like wood thrush that are territorial don't really like to nest alone in a forest patch. They want to nest in a community because males sing to each other, females choose mates, they sneak off territory. Their normal behavior involves interacting with members of the same species. Uh, hour by hour, day after day after day, there's all these interactions, a social stimulation. Um, and so even for birds that are traditionally colonial in the sense of a giant seabird colony, nevertheless, they need a large enough forest patch and need other members in the community before they're going to really settle there. And that's one of the startling things, isn't it, that you can have a piece of forest <coughs> that's a big enough territory for a bird and it's a couple of birds and their families or even three or four families and it's still not enough. If you, if you still only, and you'd think it was, you'd say, well, here's good habitat and how much do they need? They only need X number mm -hmm. of acres or whatever it may be, but it won't, they still won't do. It can, it can just sit empty. One of my favorite examples is the purple martin uh, because they nest in birdhouses. Uh, in fact, apartment buildings, not just, they, they're colonial. <laughs> And so the classic purple martin house is one where there might be 15 or 20 different compartments all in the same apartment building. And you can build the most magnificent martin house exactly to the specifications required by the species and put it near a pond, have all the holes the right size, put little bits of cedar chips inside to keep it dry, have nice ventilation holes. You get it, it's the, the Hilton of bird houses. <laughs> and it can be in the perfect habitat but it will sit empty unless there's other purple martins in the area because they're highly social. And if you put up the perfect house, but you don't have purple martins in your area, you know, within you know, a few hundred meters away or a kilometer, without the martins around, you can't get a new colony started. So it's a real catch-22 that you can't get purple martins unless you already have purple martins. Yeah. So when you lose them out of an area, you don't necessarily get them back just because the habitat improves again or something like that. No, and with something yeah. like these purple martins that we've been talking about, if you get really bad weather, two weeks of rain and cold, it can wipe out the entire local population. They just die. They, can't, they, they feed only on flying insects, and with really horrible weather, there's no food to eat, and they perish. And it can take decades for a region that has lost its purple martins to rebuild its numbers. Not, as I said, not just, but the habitat is still there. The houses are still mm -hmm. there. People haven't suddenly taken the houses down. They want the birds back. It's yeah. just that without those numbers to draw in the newcomers, the newcomers go elsewhere to where there still are martins. It might be just one cold snap. That can do you in for you know, 20 or 30 years. And this, they'll slowly come back, but it's not an instant overnight That's recovery. They're a favorite of yours, eh? Purple Martins. They are. I did yeah. my, my PhD yeah. thesis on Purple Martins. Yeah. Uh, so I have a special fondness for them. And I'm studying them again now uh, after a hiatus. So yeah. uh, they're fun because they're so highly visible. Um, and you know, in, in one place, you don't have to work hard to find their nests because <laughs> they're in a birdhouse. <laughs> you don't have to work hard to see uh, who's who, their leg bands. We put numbered bands on everybody's legs. When I'm in the forest, it could take an hour to sneak up on a bird close enough and get a good enough look to actually see what color leg bands it has on so that I can tell who exactly that bird is. Everybody gets a different code, you see. Mm -hmm. But these purple martins are all out sitting around on their porches and decks and uh, almost showing off their legs to you. Uh, so you can get, uh, it, make, it makes that part of the work um, fairly straightforward, although yeah. it's certainly true. Most Martin houses are in people's backyards or in parks, yeah. and so it's not what I would call a true nature experience the way it is. But that's fascinating too, isn't it? Because, because there was a time when there were no birdhouses like that, and they lived elsewhere. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and their previous preferred dwellings aren't available anymore, but they've adapted very comfortably to these. To well, purple uh, Martins have switched entirely. I mean, there, there actually still are natural places for them to nest which makes it even more curious that they've, they're, they're, at least in Eastern North America, they only use birdhouses, or 99.9% .9 of the time they, they only use birdhouses. So it's, uh, again, we're talking about the physical habitat is still there for them to nest in cliffs, in tree cavities, but it's, the, it's a cultural shift in what their brains tell them 
is a good nest site. And I mm -hmm. no one's done the experiment, but I suspect that when the young grow up in a birdhouse, when they're older, they look for birdhouse. Yes. Of course. And as more and more birds use birdhouses, then the offspring are going to use birdhouses, and it becomes a true cultural shift in terms of what suitable nest sites are, are like. Chimney swifts have done the same thing. Have they? Chimney mm -hmm. swifts, before there were you know, people living all over North America, nested in hollowed out tree cavities and in cliffs. Now mm -hmm. they're in chimneys, which is to their demise because the old fashioned chimneys used to be open, big industrial smokestacks. Mm -hmm. uh, and we get large colonies and roosts of chimney swifts uh, in these artificial nest sites. Now people weren't making chimneys for the birds, so it's not no, the same no, as a birdhouse. So. Yeah. Um, but modern chimneys now are capped or they're lined on the inside, which prevents the birds from using them. And the chimney swift in Canada has declined dramatically. It's now a species at risk, in part because it switched from natural nest sites to chimneys, and now we're taking the chimneys away, essentially, and there are not as many nest sites. There may be other problems facing them as yeah. well, but they're, yeah. they're an example of a, a bird that nests almost exclusively in man-made dwellings. Well, that kind of brings us to the driving force behind Silence of the Songbirds, right? which is the decline of, right. of songbirds, I guess particularly of migrant songbirds, but, um, but of songbirds more broadly too. What are the causes of that? I mean, we, there are quite a few of them. but Quite a few. It's, um, again, it's a little frustrating to try to pin down all the different causes. It almost seems that the list is so long, it's hard to know where to start. Uh, first and foremost, habitat loss. Uh, birds need homes, uh, they need places to breed, they need stopover sites on migration where they can refuel. These long distance migrants spend the winter in tropical countries, uh, especially forest birds like, um, you know, like the Canada warbler, the olive-sided flycatcher. These are boreal forest songbirds who have extensive breeding habitat left here in Canada, and yet they're declining. Well, they need forest on the wintering grounds too. Mm -hmm. And the rates of tropical deforestation are high, the highest ever in the history of mankind in terms of the rate at which tropical forest is being clear cut and turned into agriculture. Uh, it's as though we were here in North America during the 1800s, right? And we were doing that, we did that here. Mm -hmm. Now that's happening in Latin America. So it's really no surprise, I suppose, that Canadian birds with extensive breeding habitat are nevertheless declining because they can't survive the winter without good quality tropical rainforest to live in. And that's actually where they spend the largest piece of the year, right? They, yeah. There's uh, a, the breeding period is fairly short and there's a big mm -hmm. migration on each side, but the one sort of rest period is that long tropical... Yep. Our Canadian birds probably arrive, depending on where they're going, they probably arrive on their wintering territory sometime in October and they leave to come back perhaps in April. You know? So we've got October, it's like November, December, January, February, March, April. That's six months of the year in the tropics. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. probably spend a month getting there and a month getting back. So that only leaves a few months left for them to actually be here breeding. Yeah. Yeah. And the Trump, but that makes them even more reliant on the tropics than they are in the boreal forest in a way because they're there for six months and here for three. Right, right. right. I mean, here they come here to breed. Mm -hmm. That's the only mm -hmm. reason they come here is to breed because they have long summer nights, lots of food, insect food, lots of habitat. If you look at the geography of Canada, there's an awful lot of habitat up north. They come up here to breed, uh, and the rest of the year their job is to survive. Mm -hmm. just to stay alive. They don't breed on the wintering grounds at all. They go all the way down there and they just have to stay alive and come all the way back again to yeah. get another chance to breed. Actually, even in the natural course of events, they don't live very long, do they? No, these awesome. are small birds and this migration journey is, is tremendous. I mean, individual birds are flying 6,000, 8,000, 10,000 kilometers each year. So that's, a, that's always been a dangerous journey. Uh, we talk mm. flying across the Gulf of Mexico, dangerous. These little birds don't swim, so if they run out of fuel or hit a storm as they're halfway across the Gulf, they're goners. They're, and mm -hmm. people have shown that when hurricanes hit at the bad moment, you know, the next day there's dead songbirds washing up on the beach, you know, mm -hmm. showing the evidence of the ones that didn't make it. So I would say 
um, it's hard to know because nobody really measured survival 400 years ago. <laughs> we don't know what the numbers were. But the conventional wisdom, about half of these little songbirds die every year. Yeah, that's a huge loss. So when you that's look a at loss. a population of you know, yellow warblers or uh, bobolinks, most of them are one-year-old birds breeding for the first yeah. time. Right? And then maybe a quarter of them are two-year-old birds breeding for the second time. And, of course, the percentage that are three years or older is, is pretty small. It's tiny. Yeah. 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 And, uh, but we do, we, we do have some measurements of, of actual decline, right? They yes. may not be very precise, but there's some pretty mm -hmm. solid indications. To right. Tell me there's about how we, how we measure that. How yeah, there's that. different ways of measuring songbird declines and keeping in mind that you're, do, you're trying to count the num you know, get an estimate of the number of individuals, relatively speaking, of a species that might breed across the whole boreal forest or breed across the entire eastern half of North America. The bobolink breeds in a narrow band along the Canada-US border from one coast to the other. How do you count that? <laughs> That's a daunting task. It's yes. not easy. Yeah. These things have big ranges. Well, the two main ways are the breeding bird survey, which was started in the 1960s, soon after Rachel Carson's book, uh, Silent Spring, was published showing massive bird declines, uh, the clear link with pesticides, uh, interfering with the bird's reproduction, killing them outright when, it, when given in large doses. And it was the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that realized if birds are the canary in the coal mine telling us that there's environmental problems, we need to know when birds are declining for our own sake, mm -hmm. right? Well, how do we do that? So they started this big volunteer survey that takes place in June of every year, and there's thousands of different surveys that are done across Canada and the U.S., and each one is done exactly the same way. So strict methods, all volunteer-based, because who could afford to hire thousands of people to do that and actually pay them and pay their mileage? There's no money for that. So we rely on volunteer bird watchers and birders, and they've been counting the same routes since 1966. So we're getting, now at the beginning, the first few years, you don't learn a whole lot from that. Mm. But now that we're in the year 2010, we can look back with hindsight and see how the numbers compare today versus 40 years ago. And because the methods are fairly strict and it's all analyzed very professionally by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and you can go online and pick mm -hmm. any species you like and look at the data yourself. It's fully accessible to everybody. Dozens of species have shown this horrible, steep decline in numbers mm -hmm. over the past 40 years. And it's, if it was one species declining, we might write that off as something unimportant or yeah, rare. Some special, yeah, some special circumstances, or, yeah. or yeah. maybe it has a special habitat it requires. and. And if it was just one, we could focus on why is this one declining? What do we need to do to fix this one problem? Well, it's not one, it's dozens. And that's really disheartening. I mean, tremendously saddening, I mean, everything else yeah. aside. Pesticides, loss of habitat, mm -hmm. tat, other, other causes. Uh, the other causes involve... Um, the breeding grounds, which we talked about loss of habitat, but one of the problems on the breeding grounds in particular is feral cats or domestic cats. Um, because you know, that sort of goes hand in hand with habitat loss. Part of the habitat loss is that birds end up in patches of forest near people. Now there are lots of areas like the boreal forest and, and parts of the east where there's extensive forest and it's, very, uh, it's not densely populated with people. And so birds can go about their business, you know, without worrying about someone in their backyard. But certainly uh, in the areas that I've worked, cats are everywhere in the forest. And they're uh, unnatural predators. They're an invasive species. We think of biologically, they're invasives. Uh, and they do kill large numbers of birds on migration and on the breeding grounds. It's hundreds of millions of birds are killed annually by cats. And this is an unnatural source of predation, which did not happen 200 years ago. This whole business about having pet dogs and cats is a fairly recent cultural shift in, in our own world. 
Uh, and yeah, people let cats out, let, they let dogs, no, no, it's more largely cats are the problem, but I know dogs sometimes too go after game and wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other major problems is, uh, is, relates to migration, and that is collisions with buildings and TV towers and other kinds of structures. Because these birds migrate at night, they're attracted to the bright lights of cities and the lights that are on TV towers, and uh, they are attracted to them because they use stars to navigate. So they're, again, their natural system, navigation system, uses stars. So on cloudy nights, rainy nights, where they can't see the stars, they see lights, and like a moth drawn to a flame, they go towards the lights. And then they get trapped flying around the lights, and if you're talking about one of these, you know, those really tall TV towers with the guy lines mm -hmm. that go out, mm -hmm. they try to fly around the tower, circling the light, and they fly into the wires and just drop. And so it's not uncommon to find hundreds of dead birds underneath a single tower. If the weather conditions are just a foggy night, rainy night, uh, there's dozens and dozens of examples where people have found large numbers of dead migrants, uh, also in big cities. Toronto, for instance, mm -hmm. they find hundreds of dead birds every season that have been trapped in the city centre and get exhausted because there's no food, they get hit by cars, they fly into buildings. It's just really a slaughter when birds try to go through these kind of tall structures that are lit like mm -hmm. that. And on a clear night, they might do all right. Clear night, they probably sail over the whole thing. Don't, Just yeah. the occasional yeah, the casualty. That's yeah, because yeah, so the problem is that you know being attracted to the light. Once they're drawn in by the light, then they have the collision problem. Yeah. So without that attraction in the first place, they would just fly over the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other major issues that we should be thinking about in terms of the decline? Yeah, um, in terms of what's causing the decline. Um, I think there's been a big debate as to what's more important, the breeding grounds or the wintering grounds. And on the breeding grounds, we have the habitat loss. Uh, with the habitat loss come these clever birds called cowbirds who used to not be in eastern North America because it was heavily forested. Cowbirds are an open country bird from the west. And the reason I call cowbirds clever is because the female never builds a nest, never feeds the young, and never incubates the eggs. But she can still produce lots of offspring because she sneaks her egg into someone else's nest. So she lays her eggs in the other species' nests and then abandons the egg and lets that mother raise the egg for her, kind of the ugly duckling mm -hmm. kind of scenario. Uh, so a lot of people have blamed songbird declines on habitat loss on the breeding grounds, which increases the bird's exposure to cowbirds, to cats, to other kinds of predators, skunks and raccoons. And for many people, that's where, how we should tackle the problem is breeding grounds only. But I've traveled to the tropics a lot, had the good fortune to do field research down there. Uh, and I think when you go down there and see the full extent of habitat loss in the tropics, uh, get some appreciation of the types of pesticides that are used in those areas. I mean, pesticides are, are some of the top 10 pesticides used in tropical countries are chemicals that are banned here because they're so dangerous, and yet they're in the top 10 list down there. Uh, our songbirds are facing you know, enormous challenges surviving the winter from habitat loss and pesticides that I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm on the other camp, I guess, that, that I think that for many of our birds, uh, we're kind of chasing down the wrong street by focusing too heavily on the breeding grounds, which is tempting because it's in our own backyards. It's something that we can control and manage more easily because it's our country, and so we can take care of the problem more easily, perhaps. But, um, I don't think there's nearly as enough emphasis on h how these birds survive the winter and what's happening to them when they're so far away. Let's hear another one. Oh, 
Who's that lovely singer? That lovely singer is the Hooded Warbler. Well, this is one of your real this babies. This is one of my favorites, yeah. yeah. I, when I did my PhD, I studied purple martins. And when I did my master's degree, I studied tree swallows. My early life studying birds was all nest boxes and swallows that were very easy to see. Then I switched to forest birds, in particular this one, the hooded warbler. And I can remember the first time going into the forest where my study site still is today, walking through that forest trying to see a hooded warbler. And I could hear this darn song, wee -de wee -de wee -de -oh. I could hear the song, but there were so many other birds singing, it was really hard for me at the time, being new to it, to pick out that particular sound. And I could hear some singing, but darn it if I could not see one because I wasn't trained yet on how to do the sneaking up on birds in the forest and get close enough to catch a glimpse through the leaves. I was so used to studying birds, backyard birds, um, that it took a little bit of a learning curve to, to track these guys down. I've been studying hooded warblers now since about 1990, so uh, they're one of my favorite birds to study. They're so colorful, they're so vocal, and most importantly, their nests are this high off the ground. They nest in the shrubs, so the nests are easy to find and to follow compared to the ones that are up in the trees. It's a lovely song. Yeah. Tell me about the ecological services that songbirds perform, because I think it's easy for, for those who still think of us as the lords of creation to think, well, sad if they go away, but it really doesn't make much difference to us, but it does make a lot of difference to us. Yeah, I think of songbirds as nature's blue-collar workers, that they have really important jobs. They're not just out there mating and building nests and raising young, but in the entire community ecosystem, they have important jobs. And one of them, of course, is, is predators. Now we think of red-tailed hawks and eagles as predators, but the little hooded warbler is also a predator because it eats insects, in particular caterpillars. And the numerous studies have been done trying to gauge just how important is this insect control job that the songbirds do. And one way to test this is to kind of screen off a tree to prevent the birds from getting there, and then measure what happens with the insects who in turn are feeding on the leaves of the trees. So the caterpillars are eating the tree leaves, and sure enough, not surprisingly, if you stop the birds from doing their job, suddenly you get a lot more insects, a lot more leaf damage to the trees, and they've even shown that the tree growth slows down. Just because the birds aren't in there eating the insects, who in turn are eating the trees. So one of their big jobs is, is be a natural form of insect control. Well, humans can do insect control too with chemicals. But when humans try it, it costs a lot of money, and the insects evolve resistance to the chemicals. But that doesn't happen with the birds, right? Because it's com com perfectly natural, and of course the insects have already tried to evolve and outsmart the birds to, to not get eaten in the first place. But, there, but there's no way that the insect can suddenly evolve resistance to birds eating them, because that's been going on for thousands of years. Um, birds have other jobs, too. Uh, one of them is to help plants reproduce. So we don't often think of birds as being involved in the, in the sex lives of plants, but yes, they are, because so many trees and shrubs produce fruit, which is bird dispersed. So, so, uh, and so things like cherry trees. Cherries are disp dispersed primarily, wild cherries dispersed primarily by birds. Uh, things like Virginia creeper produce fruits, and that fruit is dispersed primarily by birds. And the list goes on. All kinds of native shrubs and trees who rely on these millions and millions of birds out there to move the fruit away from the parent. What's in the fruit? The seeds, of course. So the plant makes the fruit as a treat to lure in the bird, to eat the fruit, to fly away, and deposit the seeds some other place. And of course, as the bird numbers have dropped by an estimated 30 or 40 percent over the past decades, yes, there are going to be ripple effects on the forests through, you know, more insect predation on the leaves in the forest, and also uh, this ha um, hampered ability of the trees to actually disperse their fruits away from the parent plant. 
So yeah, so you finally get a very, I mean, if you couldn't disperse the, the seeds, presumably all you would have would be a, a whole grove of the same tree growing within, almost in the root system of the parent tree, right? Well, that, right, and I think and um, a number of studies have shown that, you know, that's a, that if you do, if you plant the seeds close to the parent tree, they're not going to do very well. Mm -hmm. um, but especially when we're thinking in the context of trying to do ecological restoration. So we have areas, say farms have been abandoned, uh, or, or humans have used a habitat, and now we want it to go back to nature. How do we get those trees back in that area? Mm -hmm. We can run around with a shovel and plant wild cherry trees, or we can let the birds come and do it for free. And again, a number of studies have measured natural uh, ecological restoration by birds who are just doing what they do. If you, you can facilitate this or encourage it by putting up perches. So if you're trying to restore a field, you put perches out in the field for the birds to land on. And of course, they'll land there after eating fruits and the seeds will come out. And they can actually accelerate the whole process of habitat restoration without having to do the tree planting and fertilizing and tree tubes and all the other expensive uh, in terms of staff and, and materials that you would require for the humans to try to do the same job. Yeah. Which species was it that was a spectacularly effective control of the spruce budworm? Well, we I've have forgotten. A, yeah, we have a number. Um, I think the, the black pole warbler is in one of those groups that, that, uh, that, that controls the budworm. And there's kind of a, um, I think the Cape May warbler as well. They naturally mm -hmm. kind of follow the budworm outbreaks. And so in years where you have a budworm outbreak, those birds will breed at very high density. And then in other years where the budworm's naturally low, then the birds kind of spread out and go elsewhere. Mm. Um, but they were able to do a diet study looking at how, how much, what exactly the birds are eating. And we're estimating some, I forget the exact number, but the, their estimate of, you take all the songbirds in one hectare and estimate how many budworm caterpillars are they eating is an enormous number. So again, in terms of, uh, I mean, they, they don't eat so much that the budworm outbreak won't happen in the first place, but they're very important for keeping the numbers low in years where they ordinarily uh, wouldn't be a massive outbreak. Yeah, yeah, well the budworm's kind of endemic, I guess. You know, well, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a natural up, cycle. It's, it's like tent caterpillars or something. It's yeah. perfectly natural to have these boom and bust cycles in, yeah. in the caterpillar world. And these birds naturally just track that. And our efforts to control it otherwise are very expensive and not very efficient, very effective. You know? Yeah, and often yeah. involve dangerous chemicals that, yeah. again, that, that the insects can evolve resistance to, or just that some of those chemicals, ironically, hurt the birds and interfere with their reproduction. So you're, you're kind of removing, to some extent, the natural control which is there by, yeah. by diminishing their numbers. Is it fair to say that we can't get along without songbirds, but songbirds can get along without us? Yeah, that's fair to say. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, uh, human society and, and health does not depend uh, directly on songbirds as a source of food. Um, we do depend on their ecological services. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, but you could take humans off the planet, you know, do that experiment and snap your fingers or wave your magic wand and have us all go away and, you know, the birds would just carry on. Yeah. Yeah. So but kind of sobering. What, what, what can we, um, as individuals and, and uh, you know, concerned people, what can we do to at least alleviate some of the strains on the songbird population? Yeah, I th I'm a big fan of consumerism. Uh, in the sense of educating people about, you know, getting them excited about birds in the first mm -hmm. place uh, and making them realize that there's a serious problem, great, so that's step two. And then step three is all of us can easily help. It's just so easy. Okay. Uh, which involves what, what do you do when you're in the store? So are you going to go and buy toilet paper that comes 100% from freshly cut down trees? Or are you going to go with the toilet paper that comes post-consumer? Yeah. And that's an easy choice. You're in the grocery store, you're shopping, you might have your favorite brand that you usually pick up. But if you stop and think just for a moment about where your paper products come from, most stores do carry ecologically friendly alternatives. And it's just a matter of 
It's like changing the channel on the TV. Our shopping habits um, are, don't always make sense. You buy the same brand because you've always bought it, or you buy it because you, you, your parents bought it, and now you're buying. I mean, it's, you don't always start from scratch. So what I'm asking people to do is to start from scratch and just rethink their shopping habits. Why in January are you buying tomatoes from Mexico? Do you know how they're grown? Do you know what chemicals they put on them? Do you know how bad that is for farmers in Mexico? Do you know how many pesticide residues are still on the tomatoes that you're taking home with you? If people know that, then they'll go, you know, I've never thought twice about where tomatoes come from when I go to the store in January. But now I'm starting to see, oh, it's from Mexico. Oh, there are these, there are these consequences of me supporting those kind of products. So can I live without tomatoes in my salad for a couple more months until they're available? Or can I maybe buy the ones from Florida instead? I've seen people in, in, in the summertime buying tomatoes from Mexico when right next door there were locally grown tomatoes for sale too. And they don't even look at where they're coming from. And so again, it's, it's the idea of getting people to think about where does your food come from? Where do the resources come from? And most people with even just the slightest interest in nature or the, or the slightest concern about what kind of future their children are gonna have in a world with so many more people and so many more demands on the planet, it's a simple decision to make. Buy the recycled paper products, avoid tomatoes from Mexico. I'm not picking on Mexico, by no, the no, way, but, but I just yeah. my point is that those Latin American produce does use large quantities of pesticides. It's not safe for the environment. It's probably not safe for our health. Yeah, and yet, and yet, one, and so, as soon as you point that out to people, now I've had lots of people tell me, you know, I never even looked at where this yeah. stuff came from. When I see, you know, uh, strawberries from Chile or melons from Guatemala, I don't buy it anymore. Mm. It's not organic and it's not really safe. And I, I guess I don't really need that melon. I can wait till the summer and I can buy it. Yeah. grown yeah. closer to home. Uh, and my other favorite one is coffee. Yes. Uh, I'm involved closely in trying to promote shade-grown coffee because I think this is, most people have heard about or, you know, organic food, most people have heard about recycled paper products. Um, th those issues go to, to all kinds of, all, there's all kinds of reasons to be interested in those. Even if you don't know anything about birds, you might buy recycled paper products because you care about climate change. But when it comes to coffee, that always catches people off guard because they haven't thought about where their coffee comes from. Yes, most people, where does your coffee come from? And they'll say, oh, Tim Hortons. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> where does it come from? They, I don't know. I mean, people don't think about it. They know bananas come from the tropics. That's kind of obvious. But a lot of people don't even realize truly that coffee is grown only in tropical regions. And how is it grown? They have no idea. They wouldn't know a coffee plant if I waved one under their nose. I mean, because no one's, how would you know what it looks like if you haven't seen pictures or gone there? You could do a little photo display, pick out the coffee. Uh, and as I'm not making fun of people's ignorance at all. It's a, it's a genuine, yeah. uh, just lack of familiarity with where food comes from. So coffee, uh, a lot of coffee now is grown out in the open as though it's a cornfield. Sun-grown Cafea Robusta is the name of it, Cafea Robusta. And it's grown out in the open, big industrial fields, lots of herbicides, fungicides, pesticides, you name it. Big commercial operations. It's not your family farm. Provides no habitat at all for anything. Uh, soil erosion is extreme in those areas. The soil just washes away. Now, the traditional coffee farm most people can picture the ads on TV or maybe documentaries they've seen. The coffee is grown in a forest. And the, the original coffee plant, Scafea arabica, is a forest-loving shrub that's grown in the forest. Uh, and that's the, the shade-grown coffee. The concept of that is to provide certifications for coffee farms where, when the coffee actually comes from a forest. And by certifying the coffee as shade-grown, then consumers know the difference between something that provides no habitat and relies on pesticides versus one that actually provides good wildlife habitat.
And that's the important, that's the key thing about the shade grown coffee is that it, is that it mimics a forest. It may be a plantation to a considerable extent, mm -hmm. but it mimics a forest and it does provide a place where things like songbirds can actually carry on a more or less normal life, right? Yeah, it's not a choice between agriculture or no agriculture. Yeah. I mean, nor most crops have to be grown in full sun, so you have a choice. You're going to have forest or you're going to have agriculture. But in the case of coffee, it's a win-win. Mm. The coffee farmer, if he's paid a premium for shade-grown, organic, fair trade coffee, it's usually a, you know, a triple package, yeah. um, the coffee farmer gets a fair price, he gets a good price, and at the same time we're supporting you know, sustainable agriculture and providing really good habitat, not just for, for birds, but for any kind of forest plant or animal. Uh, you're kind of providing a lifeboat of sorts. In many coffee growing regions, the only areas left with trees are the coffee plantations themselves because there are, you know, there, there may not be national parks or untouched forest, uh, especially in Central America, you know, a lot of the deforestation has already occurred and, and the little bits of forest left are coffee plantations. Well, we want to give those farmers a good reason not to switch to sun-grown or not to go bankrupt and have their coffee farm bought up by a big company and then turned into sun-grown coffee. So it's a way of... Uh, it's Being getting easier and easier to do too. I mean, they, mm -hmm. I think the opportunities to buy, uh, you know, organic, you know, uh, shade-grown coffee are, are much more. Yeah. You, it would have been it would have been pretty difficult ten years ago. Today right. it's pretty easy. Right. I think yeah. the the again the awareness is there, and the coffee roasters and coffee suppliers are more aware of the consumer interest now. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. not only do we know that shade-grown coffee is good biologically speaking. But, the, but they're actually companies that are selling it, and they're, you, know, you can buy it over the internet from any number of places. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the key certification to look for is bird friendly certified, because there's a lot of imitations. It's just like the, you know, what's organic food, what's yeah. really organic, and what isn't. Um, I think you know, we need to pay careful attention to whether it's certified or not and how it's mm -hmm. certified. Because uh, there are a lot of sort of greenwashing going on where people will put a nice red-eyed tree frog on the label and say that it's, you know, uh, bird safe or uh, ecologically friendly or sustainable. But those are just the words on the package unless it's independently certified, you know, by a and the same reputable thing organization, the then you don't, you know, you, you, it might just be a con job, right? Sure. And so you're paying extra money, but the farmer's not getting it, and there's no habitat supported. Yeah. It's just somebody with a fancy bag. The same as the FSC uh, right. wood products, forest uh, stewardship That's the same certified, idea, yeah. same principle. And somebody yeah. independently goes out there, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not just me party. saying Yeah, it's a third-party independent. Yeah. I mean, it's like the, uh, the MSC now, right? The Marine Stewardship Council for Seafood. That's really picking up. Uh, yeah. huge momentum and just like FSC now is pretty much the standard f uh, for a lot of the paper products the MSC mm -hmm. for seafood is going to be mainstream in a few years and what I'd like to see happen is for coffee which isn't captured in either of those of course uh, coffee drinkers consume millions of cups of coffee a day it's coffee is a more valuable export product than even oil believe it or not mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so Coffee is a market uh, for which there currently is no, you know, uh, widespread certification being used by the big coffee companies. Mm -hmm. So the bird-friendly certification, which is the gold standard, was for the Smithsonian Institution does this one. Oh, okay. So it's Smithsonian uh, bird-friendly certification, third party, it's, it's actual real forest that the coffee's coming from. Uh, that's what we're looking for, and yet what we want to see happen is that the big coffee companies start offering truly shade-grown coffee as part of their product line. Mm -hmm. Just like F, you know, almost all the envelopes I get nowadays, FSC, you know, on the back. Yes. And uh, yeah. 10, 15 years ago, that wasn't the case. No, that's, that's fairly. Right. It's fairly new, and it's been incredibly successful. And I yes. think MSC also will be incredibly successful. So why not for coffee? Why hasn't this happened for coffee yet? It needs to because that's. Because that, there haven't way. been enough conversations like this held well, in the public. Well, in part they have, yeah. and you know, part part of it. You're right. It's availability, mm -hmm. that the knowledge has been there, but I don't think the public. Is, is as aware about yeah. the certification as they could be. Part of it also is because 
there's a bit of a battle going on as to who, which of the certifications out there is going to be the one adopted broadly yeah. by the big boys. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, Smithsonian wants it certified. Well, and it's true, their certification is the best, biologically speaking, for sure. But you've got Rainforest Alliance and this group and that group. And, and so the consumer's confused because there are these different certifications and they don't know which one to choose. Mm -hmm. In fact, most consumers think that if it's fair traded, it's shade grown. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not true. But they don't know that because yeah. it's confusing. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, we do need some standards for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. I have the impression that, that, um, um, that the work you do, which is scientific work, rests on a substrate of, of kind of delight and love. Um, what is it that you love most about songbirds? Um, for me, it's uh, definitely their, their kind of their secret lives behind the scenes behavior. Um, I got captivated, I think, studying s the idea of studying songbirds. I can remember the moment where I just, my curiosity was just peaked and there was no turning back. This was when I was an undergraduate student studying tree swallows and I was opening up the nest boxes, checking them. That was my summer job to check all the boxes and write down four eggs or six eggs or two nestlings. Or, and I opened up this one box and there were two females inside locked in battle rolling around inside, pecking each other on the head, beating each other up. And I was so shocked. And I'd been studying, you know, they had this job for a few weeks, and I thought of tree swallows as just being these cute, adorable little birds that fly around and chitter-chatter, uh, have delicate little beaks and shiny, beautiful, shiny, iridescent colors. And they're just beautiful to watch, beautiful to listen to, exciting to catch. I had no idea they had this kind of violence in their life. And it wasn't until I studied it further that I realized that these kind of battles are not uncommon, even among females, not uncommon. It's kind of a survival of the fittest, Darwinian kind of view. Uh, but I think for a lot of people, bird watchers, they see birds as beautiful. They like them because they're beautiful. And they might be fun to see at your feeder, but the, the actual real behavior that these birds do in their own lives, not, not for our pleasure, but just their ordinary day-to-day -day behavior is incredibly fascinating. So I got hooked on looking, uh, not just at the conservation, but at, at how they compete for resources, how they choose their mates. You know, these birds have tiny little brains, smaller than my little fingernail, and yet all this action is going on in there. You know, we call them bird brains, but it's amazing what they're capable of doing. Here at The Green Interview, we think that part of our job is to remind ourselves and our viewers of the glorious complexity and subtlety of the natural world. If you appreciated this conversation with Dr. Bridget Stutchbury, you'll also enjoy our upcoming visit with Robert Bateman, perhaps the most celebrated wildlife artist in the world. And you may want to listen in on our conversations with Farley Mowat and Paul Watson, two of the world's greatest defenders of wildlife. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. See you next time.